Corrections on guard off. Todd Corbett, we revoke fire. Amelia Flights, Trinity County Fire Safe Council Coordinator, Watershed Program Manager for the Trinity County Resource Conservation District, Bethany. Bethany Llewellyn, uh, Trinity County Resource Conservation District, Forest Health Program Coordinator. Good afternoon, Tim Ritchie, Fuels Battalion Chief on the Trinity River Management Unit for the Forest Service. I'm Ren Winter with Trinity River Lumber. Dave Hotamigo, Forester Cal Fire. Kelly Sheen, District Manager for the Trinity County Resource Conservation District. Chris Cole, Forest Health Program Manager, Trinity County Resource Conservation District. Chris Woodman, Shasta Trinity, Fuels, Fuel Bill. Anise and Toronto Project, Watershed Project Coordinator, Trinity County Resource Conservation District. Charlie Curtin, Grizzly Port Fellow, Trinity County Resource Conservation District. Miles Raymond, Grizzly Port Fellow for the Trinity County Resource Conservation District. On to the Zoom. Let's go with Carol. Hi, uh, Carol Fall, Assistant Chief, Trinity Center Volunteer Fire Department. Mike. Hi, I'm Mike Catoni, Deputy Director for Trinity County OES. Philip. Philip Simi, Trinity County OES Manager. Deb. Deb, we can't hear you. I don't know if your sound isn't connected yet. All right. We'll move to Denise while Deb gets that sorted out. Hi, Denise Wesley, GIS Manager for the Trinity County RCD. Mike Wilson. Mike Wilson, Northern California Regional Coordinator of California Fire Safe Council. Uh, Julia. Hi, County of Humboldt. Uh, County Coordinator and Flash Program Manager. Thank you for joining us. Get that done so that they can present. Uh, Jerry. Uh, Jerry Cousins, Trinity County Collaborative Member. Regina Moon. Gina Moon with the Willow Creek Fire Safe Council. Larry. Larry Glass, Safe Alternatives for Our Forest Environment from South Fork Mountain. Great. Uh, Xander. Xander Winter, Forester at the Watershed Center. Uh, Lejean. Lejean Heyman, a Natural Resource Specialist on the Mad River Ranger District, Six Rivers National Forest. Aaron. Aaron Taylor, Acting District Conservationist for the Weaverville NRCS Field Office. Nathan. Nate Arch, uh, the new fuels planner for TRMU uh, Forest Service. Uh, and Deb, did your sound start working? No. <sighs> Thank you for joining us. So Deborah Harris with the North Coast Unified Air Quality Management District. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to number two, additions or changes to the agenda. I think we can scratch the Caltrans Main Street Weaverville Tree Project. I don't see anybody here from Caltrans. Okay, so moving on to item three, discussion day. Trinity County Fire Safe Council, and will you chair nominations? Um, so I have a proposal to put forward to the Fire Safe Council that um, we continue with uh, Todd as our interim chair until we finalize our MOU and then um, under the new MOU, we do our official chair and vice chair um, selection and process. Are there any objections to um, using that model with the intent that we have a MOU ready by the 1st of January, uh, ready to be signed by the 1st of January? So moved. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Julia to, if you have a, anything you'd like to share with the screen, you're welcome to do so. Um, she is here today from the Humboldt County Fire Safe Council to present to us on their FLASH program. Um, so this program is being um, utilized in some of the greater Willow Creek area and so it was encouraged that um, the Trinity County Fire Safe Council consider uh, applying this onto some of the community in Trinity. And so I invited her here to share with us how she uh, runs and implements this program um, and for us to all learn a little bit about it. Um, and then we can see how 
it may or may not work or tweak it for Trinity County. Um, so without further ado, I will hand it over to Julia. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great, thank you so much for the invitation. Really glad to be here and it's um, just really cool to see how other fire system councils operate. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, let's see. All right, are we seeing a PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, excellent. So I think just as I go through this presentation, please feel free to jump in with questions. I cannot see my Zoom, just so you know. So um, give me a, a verbal cue if you if you have a question. Um, and then of course at the end, hopefully we'll have some good discussion about this program. So the Fire Adapted Landscape and Safe Homes Program, better known as FLASH, is a cost share rebate program for hazardous fuel reduction for private landowners in Humboldt County. The program provides participants with financial assistance and recommendations on how to effectively create defensible space around homes and reduce hazardous fuels along access routes and in strategic locations on their properties. Um, let's see. There we go. Most homeowners also opt to receive a home risk assessment during their initial site visit from a flash technician that helps them better understand the risks to the structure of the home itself and what can be done to address them. Um, so while the rebate aspect is limited to vegetation removal, the home risk assessment is also an important educational component of the program. And we find that many landowners are motivated to follow up on these recommendations to complement the work that they've done in their defensible space zone as part of the project. Uh, a couple more notes here on this slide. Um, reimbursement is on a per acre basis. Landowners have the option of doing the work themselves uh, or hiring a contractor or their neighbor or their grandson to do the work. And it's generally a minimum half acre project. There we go. So these are kind of the, an outline of the steps of the program. And I think we'll kind of talk through each of these more in depth as we go through the rest of these slides. But here's kind of a, a high level overview. We get our participants lined up. They have an initial site visit, um, during which time they discuss the vegetation treatment recommendations and go through that home risk assessment, um, sign all of the paperwork and take some photos. Um, the landowner then has um, time to complete the actual project. And then finally, a final site visit in which uh, the flash technician verifies that the project was completed to the standards of the program. Um, some final documentation there as well. And lastly, they are reimbursed. And these are our 2022 per acre rates. So you'll see we have two practices identified, um, thinning and limbing and managing grass and flashy tools with brush. And depending on the, you know, the discretion of the flash technician, a per acre rate is assigned. And I'll also mention here that these were recently updated, you know, in trying to keep pace with rising costs, um, cross-referencing with um, CFIP and uh, NRCS's EQIP rates um, to try to get something that's fairly reasonable for folks. Of course, as I mentioned, this is a cost share program and in no way meant to cover the full cost of the project. So um, talking to you all today to give you some perspective on what it takes to develop a program like FLASH. So we just talked about the, the program steps that participants go through, but these are the steps that we followed in actually setting up the program. So um, we started, of course, by looking for funding. And this program has been running on and off intermittently since 2010, um, kind of at various levels and this most recent round of funding that we've acquired has been far and away the, the largest um, push that we've had. So we'll um, talk a little bit more about that. The <laughs> there we go. All right, so the first four rounds uh, beginning in 2010 were funded by the California Fire Safe Council. Um, and then in 2020, we um, acquired a Cal Fire Fire Prevention Grant um, and then more recently, we're able to um, 
kind of build in additional funding for FLASH as part of, of larger grant proposals, both through another fire prevention grant from Cal Fire um, and then another one from the California Fire Safe Council. So that's kind of been our more recent strategy to just kind of add in additional uh, funding for FLASH to kind of keep it going uh, over the years. So this is where we're at right now, more or less. Um, you know, between the funds that we have right now, we're looking to treat a little bit over 600 acres, um, something like 200 landowner participants. So back to our road map here. These next three steps happen more or less simultaneously. Um, developing and updating our program documents was a really important step that we didn't fully realize the importance of until we dove into it. And we're really lucky to have the brain trust of the Humboldt County Fire Safe Council, and in particular, Yana Valakovic with UC Cooperative Extension was a, a big asset to helping us update our home risk assessment, um, as well as our treatment guide, which lays out some of the um, eligible practices into the program. And we can take a quick look at some of those documents later. So we updated our program documents, um, all of which are posted to our FLASH website for our participants. Environmental clearance, we were successful in completing a notice of exemption under CEQA, um, which is, of course is required given that this is um, state funding through CAL FIRE. Um, and then also completed a request for proposals and contracted with four technician teams um, who each serve different geographic areas of the county and this has been particularly beneficial for example um, in the I don't know if you're familiar with the geography of Humboldt County but in the southeast uh, southwestern corner we have the Matoll watershed and so we have the Matoll Restoration Council is serving that area so they already have a lot of familiarity with the area and you know even have personal um, connections might know the neighbors might know the participants who are interested in the program so that's been uh, really beneficial in, in some areas, this has been possible. All right, um, okay, so our next step here is soliciting interest. And this is one area where we've made several improvements in the last year or so. Um, like I mentioned, we're really trying to scale up the program. And so that has come with a lot of data management and administration. So we've been able to leverage these tools listed here to help us uh, stay organized and keep on top of all of the interest that we have coming in. Um, so survey one, two, three is an application associated with ArcGIS online. And so that is an online interest form that asks a series of conditional questions to help us identify candidates for the FLASH program, as well as for um, some direct defensible space assistance uh, funding that we have you know, independent of the FLASH program and just help us give an idea of what people's needs are so that we can plan future proposals accordingly as well. So multi-purpose tool been really helpful, especially for FLASH. So um, you'll see this is um, an automation that I built in make.com. So it kind of analyzes people's response to their survey one, two, three, um, and then routes um, messages to them accordingly, whether they're eligible for the program or not. And this uh, map here is an output of survey one, two, three. That's another really nice feature of using this application that's associated with RCIS is that all of their addresses are automatically mapped on the map to help us understand the geographic distribution of our participants um, so we can plan site visits accordingly. So here's that online interest form. Um, people are greeted with some information and links about the, our offerings, what we can and cannot assist for, with. Um, like I said, multi-purpose tool connecting interested individuals with appropriate services, which might include Flash. Another neat automation, uh, when people submit an interest form, their information is automatically populated into Google Sheets. And so this is my primary tool for um, communicating with my various contractor team. And each contractor team has several flash technicians. 
So this is how we're keeping track of folks' information and then as they are, you know, attended to keeping track of their status and any um, pertinent notes that might come up. So that's been um, really a primary, primary tool. Um, anything else on there? Perhaps that's it for now. Okay. So next I think we might look at some of the, the program materials. Just really quickly, I'm not sure um, how much we want to get into this, but I'll just mention um, each of these things listed here are items that the landowners generally provided before their initial site visit so they understand what they're getting into. Um, of course, the program requirements go into lots of detail about what the FLASH program is, um, you know, why we have this program, and just kind of the mechanics of what they can expect um, when they participate, the program steps, um, the program requirements. Like I mentioned, it's generally a minimum half acre project area um, because the reimbursement is technically classified as income. Participants who receive reimbursement in excess of $600 are required to submit a W-9 form. Um, this is a hang up for a small amount of people. Um, however, we find generally if we can kind of explain the reasoning behind it, uh, we can overcome that. Um, the eligible treatments, which are described in more detail in the treatment guide, and then the, um, the rates that they can expect. And then lastly, some examples of project maps and examples of photo documentation, just kind of showing what a typical flash project will look like before and after. Those are our program requirements. Um, I'm just going to skip the FAQ since we all know what an FAQ looks like. Um, but I do want to show you our home risk assessment. Um, like I mentioned, we work really closely with BC Cooperative Extension um, to update this risk assessment with the latest science and to be just the most effective tool. We're in the process yet again of updating this um, to be really the best it can be. So explain some of the, the science of you know, fire behavior and ignitions for the landowner. And they're, you know, they've hopefully looked at this before their flash technician um, makes their initial site visit so that they have developed some good questions and have an idea of some of the principles here. Um, and then during that initial site visit, they'll look closely at it with, with the flash tech and discuss some of the characteristics of the home, um, you know, customized to their needs and interests. And the way it's laid out, you know, you have the kind of characteristic of the home and importantly, why does this matter and what can be done to improve upon it. So it goes through just top to bottom, the whole house from the roof chimney vents, siding, um, the defensible space zone, of course, um, and some kind of accessory things like firewood, water. And then lastly, I'd like to show you the treatment guide that lays out the eligible treatments for reimbursement under the program. Um, and this document really emphasizes, and you know, our flash technicians emphasize that the projects are intended to be light touch and sort of maintenance, non-ground disturbing work. And that's partly based off of our environmental compliance. We do have an exemption under CEQA. Um, so it's just kind of emphasizing those things. And I think we talked early on about our rate structure. We have two identified practices. Um, project, you know, or not projects, I should say, units within each project will fall into one of two practices, either you know, managing grass and flashy tools or thinning and removing trees and shrubs. And then within that, we have that light, moderate, or heavy tools to um, identify the actual per acre reimbursement that the participant will receive. So some of these things might look familiar to you, general principles of how to thin and limb and save vegetation um, to reduce um, the potential of wildfire spread. So the intention of this document is to help the landowner understand what is and isn't to be included in their project and also 
if the landowner does choose to hire a contractor, this is a great document that they can use to communicate with their contractor and what they would like done to their property. Disposal of materials is um, included as part of the project. All cut materials need to be disposed of before they can be reimbursed. Um, and then some of those environmental compliance considerations that I mentioned are outlined here under this on a light touch approach. So those are some of the more important program materials. We have a kind of a whole suite of forms that landowners um, need to complete also as part of their documentation of you know, a participation agreement that outlines the expectations and responsibilities of the participant um, as well as um, actual land access and then the various forms that pertain to their reimbursement. I'll just skip for the purposes of this presentation. So in the context of the site visit, we were talking about all of these documents that they've hopefully reviewed and get to talk about with the flash technician during their initial site visit. Um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about field map, which is a newer tool that we've implemented um, this summer to help our flash technicians quickly map projects while they're on site. So um, what we're looking at here is a, a screenshot, um, obviously not from the flash program, but this is a smart form. And so it allows the flash technician to very quickly enter project information on their device, iPad or cell phone about the project and it automatically updates um, that map that we were looking at from the very beginning. So the survey interest form and the mapping of the project is all kind of connected within the ArcGIS interface. Um, so that has saved a lot of time and been a really useful tool. So just some Final reflections here. We acknowledge that flash fills a niche, and this is something that we've learned more over time. Um, several rounds ago, we had initially proposed to have um, flash participants fall into, um, or, or rather, we were prioritizing participants based on elderly, and low income, and disabled status, um, you know, in an effort to help those individuals. However, I think we've learned that these populations can be better served through direct defensible space assistance services in which the, hire, the county hires a crew to come and create defensible space for that individual rather than participating in the FLASH program, which is a cost share program and requires the landowner to either do the work themselves, which in this case they might not be able to, or identify a contractor and um, coordinate the work. So it does fill a niche, it's not for everybody, but it is a really valuable incentive program and gives people a leg up on their maintenance on work that you know might seem just too overwhelming. So hopefully this can help break down that barrier to finally creating different full space around their home. Um, and then of course, it, I have it kind of layered here between that direct defensible space, which tends to be smaller scale, uh, and then larger projects, which, um, are more forest health related. Sometimes, you know, people have large acreages that they're interested in treating. Um, and those, you know, sometimes we refer to the, the EQUIP program or CSEP, uh, which, you know, to my mind has more of an emphasis on that larger scale forest health stuff. The program is constantly evolving and I will be the first to acknowledge that it is far from perfect. Um, you know, we've had some success with some recent improvements, especially with our online interest form and uh, the automations that we talked about. But it's, you know, it's a continual evolution and, and challenge um, to have this program fill as much need as possible. So ongoing process and lucky to have the Fire State Council helping us to continually improve upon it. And then just a couple photos here just to give you a sense of what these projects might look like, um, you know, within the defensible space zone, clearing, you know, what you might call flashy fuels and, and thinning and limbing up. 
turn around the deck, um, turn around the wing, and, and remove the brush. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Happy to go back or dive deeper into anything that we've talked about here. I'm going to go ahead and, and stop sharing my screen for a minute. So it looks like Carol has a question. Yeah, this is great. Um, I was just wondering, um, so it's a minimum half acre. Is that the parcel size or the treatment area that what they're proposing to treat? That's the treatment area. Okay. And part of the reason behind that is because the flash program does have, you know, a relatively high administrative cost. And so that helps us balance that administrative effort that's covering the site visit costs with the actual acreage that we get treated. And do you have a feel for like roughly what's the typical project? Is it like like a half acre or an acre, you know, kind of what's the average size then that you guys are, are bringing in? It's a good question. Um, it, it varies a good bit, solid bell curve, but I would say in the neighborhood, and this is more of what we plan for in our grant proposals in the neighborhood of two to two and a half acres per project. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much. We have a question here from Deb as well. I think I can quickly address that one. She asks if the Humboldt County Fire Safety Council maintains a list of contractors who participate in the FLAC program. So we currently do not have a list of contractors. It's been brought up several times, and I think we may eventually. There's a little bit of a challenge in that we don't have the capacity to you know, really evaluate each of these contractors. So we can't make recommendations necessarily. So I think that's been one hesitation in having a contractor list. At the same time, there is a really big need and I think that could help um, expedite the process of folks finding good contractors who can um, do good work for them as part of their flash project. I will say that the Southern Humboldt Fire Safe Council has developed a contractor list for contractors in their area, and so we prefer folks um, down there to that list. Mike, did you have? Oh, sorry. Do you have a limit on the number of times a uh, homeowner can participate in your flash program, or are they eligible to um, return multiple years as additional uh, fuel reduction maintenance is needed? It's a good question. And we have had repeat customers, never within the same round and by round, I mean, under the same grant. Mm -hmm. And those that have participated multiple times, it's generally not for the same area of their property. And the reason for this being is that the program is really to incentivize and give landowners a leg up, but it is by no means intended to help them pay for ongoing maintenance. So this is Pat Frost from Trinity Center. So do you feel that at times you're um, missing some of the uh, technologically or digitally challenged communities because you're so tech heavy? <laughs> we have tried to make accommodations for those populations. Um, for example, in the interest form, an email is not required you know, recognizing that some folks don't use email. And so in that case, you know, they, they get a phone call and then I'll walk through the interest form with them over the phone to input their information. Um, and for some of our participants, the, the paperwork is done by mail because that's the way that they operate. So we are able to accommodate those folks. But um, I acknowledge that it is easier, certainly at least for me, you know, managing so much interest um, to interact with people fully um, over the internet. Um, but there's certainly room for improvement on that front. Do we have any other questions for Julia? Mike, um, question? Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Do you have a question? Maybe not. I just saw you pop on your video. <laughs> Thank you. I have a quick question on that, on the half acre. 
um, you know, like CFIP, you could combine landowners. So a lot of folks here don't have a half acre, but there might be open space between parcels. Can landowners in this program share that, combine their lot size or whatever to get to that minimum size? Yeah. Yeah, so we have had many a project where a project extends, you know, between parcel boundaries. However, I can't think of an example in which they were like two tiny projects and together they made a half acre. Um, and I think that's likely because we have so much interest from landowners that do have larger projects that it, you know, we haven't needed to do that. Julia, do you have a waiting list or, um, you know, are, are there a bunch of people that are trying to enroll? I mean, what's the uh, match of the interest versus the funding? For now, I think I have something like 300 folks on the list in various stages of needing to be screened or site visits have been scheduled and that kind of thing. Um, but we're still taking new customers at this point in time. And the interest kind of comes in waves and corresponds with outreach pushes that we do, which has kind of been nice, like following a, like a local news TV interview, we had a huge spike in folks and then it like really peters out and then you send out a PSA and then it spikes again. So that's been kind of a, a nice way to manage the ebb and flow of interest um, because those Last thing I want to do is, you know, overpromise and get just way too much interest that we can possibly serve. Thanks. Do you, do you have a maximum acreage? Oh, actually, that's a, something I did not cover. Thank you for bringing that up. We don't have a maximum acreage, but there is a maximum reimbursement of $4,500 per <laughs> landowner. So if you divide that by, say, the highest reimbursement of $900 an acre, then that's about five acres. And is that in one um, term or through like the life of the program that landowner could only receive a maximum of uh, $4,500? That would generally be per, per grant round. Um, not that that has necessarily come up before where people were hitting that maximum most of the time. Okay. And are your, your technicians are paid for by the grants also, all the site visits and everything? So not just the actual cost share, but all the um, administrative stuff is paid for by the grants? That's exactly right. Yep. This program is 100% grant funded. Okay. Thank you, Julia. Um, so my question to our council is, um, you know, is this in something we're interested in adding to our toolkit in Trinity County? Um, and, and should I be potentially starting to, to plug that into uh, a pilot project into some of the grant rounds this winter? Or is this something we wanna table for a little bit later? I would say explore a little yeah. bit more about it okay. would be my thought. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I don't know that we have the same base of contractors, you know, that um, that they have in Humboldt County, you know, um, whether that, you know, how, how feasible it is geographically. Okay. But I, you know, in my role with the California Fire Safety Council, I've always been intrigued by their grant proposals that we funded through the California Fire Safety Council as a flash program. Okay. But, and I just say, I mean, uh, I guess I would wonder what what's the population we're really trying to serve? Um, so how many people have one, eight, one and a half acre treatment areas that they, um, you know, they would be willing to participate because I'm, I, what I see is, you know, all the little old ladies that have the house and a little lot and they just want somebody to come help them with, um, you know, the stuff they can't do. 
kind of the the niche that um, Julia said they're they're not quite picking up. So, but maybe that's just our unique area. I don't know the rest of the county how many um, one half acre treatment um, kind of parcels there would be. Part are, of yeah. that, yeah, maybe part of that would be having RCD and the Watershed Center who have been doing most of the implementation on private land, kind of just look at the, you know, from more of a mapping exercise, you know, to see what, what side, you know, what, what, what are we serving already? And is there a gap, kind of a gap, you know, uh, that we're missing? Well, and Todd might know, because Todd, you get a lot of the requests with your um, projects to go out and do this kind of stuff. So what kind of, you know, are you getting the smaller acreages or bigger ones? No, I'd say about 80% of it's over half an acre. Easy. Over half? Okay, that's cool. Good right. to know. I do think, uh, um, I guess I do kind of question as well. Um, you know, a lot of our, our contracts are disabled, elderly, low income, and most of the county qualifies as low income. Um, and so, is there a way to attract people that don't necessarily want an RCD crew on their property to do their work? And can that fill that gap where they want to do it themselves and you know incentivize them to, to do their work? Mm -hmm. um, this isn't saying you have to have an RCD crew or a Washington Center crew. And nope. I, I like the idea that it, it's a lot more uh, community buy-in, you know, a lot more ownership. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's probably a lot, there's a lot of people I'm sure doing this work already not paying themselves to do it, they're just doing it. And then RCD and Watershed Center and fire departments kind of well, where picking we, everybody else up. Where right? we see it is in the, the RCD sees it is in the request for chipping. Mm -hmm. The disposal is the toughest thing for a lot of land right. homeowners is what do you do with the stuff once you've cut it and piled it, yep. you know, and the Watershed Center with you know, burning and that sort of thing, so. I, think I have a question about uh, contractors. Um, so it doesn't matter who does the work. The uh, reimbursement is dependent on before and after pictures. Is, is that right? So a, a final site inspection is required. And at that time, the flash technician, you know, the property and make sure, make sure that the project was completed to the standards of the program and, and does take um, after photos. Uh -huh. um, so reimbursement is dependent on the acreage, not how much the contractor costs, um, which is an important thing to note. However, the participant must track their costs, um, either if they're doing the work themselves, tracking their hours, um, and then multiplying that by the state um, volunteer rate. And that's because we promised a substantial quantity of match to our grant funder. So we require them to you know, kind of help us track their contribution. Okay, but uh, again, uh, contractors, uh, somebody could just hire some JIPO person sitting under an oak tree to do the work. Absolutely. Right? Okay. Yep. And I, I think if, do you guys give any advice on some of the liabilities of that? Because if you hire Jane Chainsaw to go do work on your property, you absorb the potential uh, liability of an injury? Well, the, any contract or agreement would be between the landowner and their contractor. So well, that's county, do you, but do you, do you let, do you let the, potent, the flash participants know that depending on how they hire somebody to do the work, they, they, uh, they, they take on some legal liabilities for that worker? No, we, we do not um, get into that with our participants. That's, you know, that's a reality. So, you know, if they're uninsured and they drop a tree in your house, you know, you're, you're screwed. Um, if they cut their leg off, uh, they actually can file a worker's comp claim against you. That may be so. However, that would be the case you know, regardless of whether they're participating in the flash program or not. Um, right. Okay. So I just, one weird twist 
you know, so so up here, a big issue is the seasonal landowners who don't really um, aren't really invested in um, wildfire protection, and so you know, if there's a way to reach out to them and say you could hire somebody to come and do this and get reimbursed, um, that would really add to the overall fire safety of, of some of the communities that have that high. Um, percentage of homes that aren't, um, you know, full-time residents, because that, that's just been an issue, the, the part-time residents not doing anything. So just wondering if you could tweak that. Okay. And has it, um, we would expect to see more buy-in from um, where they can select their own contractor rather than when we blanket the area with RCD and Watershed Center doing it for free, um, that there would be a different amount of buy-in to a cost share program versus a free program? <laughs> well, maybe it's how you, how you notify them. I mean, the free stuff that the <clears throat> RCD and the Watershed Center is, is that's awesome. But um, unless you live here, you don't know about it. We're going to miss tons of people too. You know, get, that's just the reality. There's not unlimited crews and limited funding for us with the watershed center. So there's always people. And then lots of people like it in the world. They yeah. probably prefer to just get reimbursed. So. Okay. Um, and to Kelly's question, who would administer it? RCD. <laughs> More capacity. Uh, Good. Okay. All right, uh, thank you. Do we have any more discussion on this topic? Okay, cool, thank you. Thanks, Julia, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, great to talk to you and um, Amelia or anyone else if you would like to connect on the nitty gritty details of administration or anything else, um, I'm available for that. And of course, we'll both know if you decide to move forward with pursuing funding for a program of your own. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Shall I pop off? Yeah. Unless you want to hang out, you're welcome to. All right. Thank you, guys. Take care. Yeah, sure. OK, so um, from our Northern California Regional Meeting or with the other California Fire State Council coordinators, um, Reading Raccoon, which is Butte County Fire State Council's mascot, is um, eligible to be expanded to other fire state councils if we are interested. Um, so my question is, do we want and need a mascot? Uh, do we want and need Ready Raccoon, um, who has his own raft, if you haven't seen it? Um, or um, I semi kind of nominated Ivan a little bit as well, um, since he's the focus of our um, 2023 um, Trinity County Fire State Council calendar and his comics. Um, but I just wanted to, to bring it to everybody's attention that um, Ready Raccoon is an option if we um, would like to pursue that. So any thoughts on mascots for the Trinity County Fire State Council? So I thought I heard somewhere that they were trademarking. Um, but we, they'll- So is there like- is there a cost to once they've trademarked? Um, I mean, we would have to buy the materials. We don't have to pay them for license to use him, but we would have to buy our own ready raccoon costume if we want one. I, I. What's his message? Be ready. Be Just ready for be fire. Ready. We got, you know. Can we You'll see a photo of Ready Raccoon? Or they hear the rap. Or they hear the rap. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here it's pretty cool. And Mike Wilson's on the call. He might have more. Wildfire ready grab. <laughs> okay. Hold on. Let me share my screen with everybody. 
Comfortable without an MOU. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd be comfortable without an MOU. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, Ready Rack Room is going to be a virtual event. Yeah. 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 That's all for ready, yeah. So moving on to number four, item A, grants, letters, support. Do you want to just run through all three of these or do you want to one at a time talk about them? And how, how would you like to handle them? Um, 
Um, is Randy? Uh, Xander, are you handling the community wildfire defense grant program proposals for the watershed center? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll let him do those two, and then I'll do the other two. Okay. So go ahead, Randy. Xander. Or Xander. Sorry. Okay. Um, we're applying for uh, the new community wildfire defense grant um, through the USDA, um, and it's for non-federal areas um, that are addressed in the CWPP, and um, so it's uh, will be areas within High and Palm Valley around the community doing defensible space and ingress and egress work along roadsides, and then um, some limited sort of strategic fuels treatments um, at boundaries between um, on, on private property adjacent to federal land. Um, so that's one portion of, of the uh, grant application. And then the other portion will be um, in the Weaverville area, sort of improving and expanding upon existing fuel breaks on the, on the Democrat Ridge system. Um, so I think our, our goal is to connect um, Oregon Mountain at Oregon Summit um, with fuel break all the way down to uh, Junction City area along the trending ridge there. Um, and like I said, it'll be there are some existing fire breaks on that ridge system, but but this will serve to connect um, those features and then improve on them. Um, and then, there will also be, um, I believe, some um, de more defensible space work in Junction City, Weaverville, and possibly Douglas City also. Um, but I'm not um, not sure the the exact extent of those treatments. But that's um, that's the plan that we have for for this grant. Do you have a map at all, Xander? Um, nothing that's uh, in a format I could share effectively. I don't have a map really for the, the Weaverville side at this time. Who who was that that asked though? I I could uh, get one. You know, uh, it was it was Chris. Uh, Randy's already going to send me the shape. So, oh okay. Uh, Andrew, this is Jill. I'd like to see the map if you have one. Um, once, once we do have a map that's, that's, uh, you know, easy to share and, and readable, then we'll, uh, get those distributed. So when, when is the grant application due? October 7th. So before we meet again. Yeah. Uh, and one thing that, uh, Xander didn't hit on for the Junction City, Weaverville and Douglas City one is that, um, they are going to write in for, um, Firewise community education and support uh, for three years continued meetings in those, those communities and also um, three years supporting our neighborhood ambassador program within those communities as well. Is that Thanks, important? Amelia. Is that important enough to the criteria for the grants to make sure it's in the letter? I mean, I haven't reviewed the RFP. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. No. It's, it's primarily an input implementation grant okay. so it's kind of just to get how much money are you asking for that is still in the works but it'll be um probably in the ballpark of uh, a couple of million and is there a match required um yes with with an asterisk so um one way to avoid the match requirement is if um the entirety of the project is within um, low income areas. So we we don't have uh, we don't have an, a requirement for this proposal in this case. Not not we, all of we, not we, all of Weaverville is low income. There are some census units that used to be um, excluded from that category, like Timber Ridge. Yeah, I, I wish I could give you exact details there, um, but uh, that's 
Randy's been focusing on that that end of the project, but um, from my understanding, we uh, won't need um, any match for what we're proposing. And this is implementing things that are in the CWPP? For yes. Okay. Do, do, does this require something of saying something about uh, the cohesive strategy? U.S. Forest Service cohesive strategy for wildfire? Um, not that I know of. It, 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 double check and make you know, and throw the words in there if you need to. Okay, so uh, upon review as to if we need to include U.S. Forest Service cohesive strategy for these letters, does the council approve or it, are there any concerns or dissent to having uh, Chief Corbett sign and um, provide the letters of support to the Watershed Council for their two um, letters of support? I think it's good. Good. Okay, hearing none, we will move forward. Um, the third letter that is also relative to the same grant application, but is um, written on behalf of the trick of the Humboldt County Resource Conservation District. Humboldt County RCD is developing um, a similar. Uh, they're sorry, they're developing a proposal for the greater Willow Creek area for this program. Um, they're working with uh, the Trinity County RCD to identify um, CWPP projects within Sawyer, Hawkins Bar, South Fork Road, and Burnt Ranch to include in this project ask. Um, and so with that, it's been left vague as they are still developing um, their project, but they, uh, I, I drafted this in order to be able to send it to them um, if they move forward with their proposal. Um, but they're working, we're working very closely with them as, we, as we've been doing the Greater Willow Creek storm um, recovery. And so this will help further those efforts and continue to expand upon those. Um, I do know Randy Harris has also been talking with um, Jill Demers of Humboldt County RCD um, to get additional funds secured for the South Fork Road defensible space, uh, roadside shade and fuel break work that they're currently working on with uh, Cal Fire funds that um, are currently secured. I'd say go for it. All right, so any concerns? Um, voice them now if you have a uh, concern about sending a letter to the Humboldt County or CD in support of their application for the Greater Willow Creek area for the Community Wildfire Defense Grant Program application. Hearing done, we will move forward with that. Thank you. So Amelia, there's a thing in the chat from Regina about a um, RAT grant proposal. So when you get to the next um, item on the agenda. Copy. Yep. Yep. So I'll bring it to you. Thank you. All right. Um, Regina, do you have um, a a proposal outline that you can share with the group as to what type of project you're going to be putting forward so that then we could um, approve a, a concept letter and then I can just get it together. Uh, reviewed and sent to you? Yes, I do. Um, it's within Trinity County. It's within the Six Rivers National Forest. It happens to be off of the South Fork County Road, but it is, um, the project type will be road maintenance, fuels management, fire prevention. Um, I It's kind of implemented within the CWPP. Uh, it will include forest health improvement. There is some watershed restoration, but so the, the area that we want treated would be, it's a county road, 435, and it's off of the South Fork side up. That road does go up and over the ridge, Hennessy Ridge, and it comes down on the Hennessy County Road by the Burnt Ranch Post Office. But what we would like to see treated is where it takes off from the South Fork County Road 
And that is again, the Hennessy County Road 435 that is not winter maintained. They don't brush it. They don't do anything with it all year round. I did speak with um, Andy Pence from the Trinity County Roads Department. Um, they said they could probably waive the, uh, the permit that they usually require. And I spoke with Nolan Colgrove with the Forest Service on this side. They There is some specs that would have to be, but like Robert McConnell with Forest Service also said that road probably has the NEPA and everything need to be done. So this road identified is an ingress egress for <clears throat> summertime fire response from Burnt Ranch to get over to us. And it also could be considered an escape route for the people near near the end of South Fork, right about four mile out, there's a, a, a bluff, <clears throat> excuse me, that kind of really always has potential to slide in or it's a, it's a breaking point. <clears throat> and so with, from that road itself, up the South Fork County Road, there's within the private property that used to be SPIs, there's a little cut up road that people, so in the wintertime when it slides in, it goes, through that private property, <clears throat> get you up to the top of the Hennessy. And so this road that we would like to have brushed out, I took it the other day to kind of, a couple, three weeks ago, to kind of look over across the river to get a vantage point for the, during the Oak fire, almond fire. And I went right past the, the view shed where it's my normal lookout spot, it's so overgrown. So it's always been brushed over and again, not maintained, even though it's high use, um, after the snowdown we had December 26, it's a, a real mess, just like all of South Fork, of course, but um, it's a narrow little road that could be brushed out, cleaned up, and um, then the county could possibly grade it to their specs and then the Forest Service specs on distance. And I do remember many years ago, there was a hazard tree removal on that road and there was some work done. It's just not maintained, but it is one of our priority escape routes, ingress, egress, high use for many, you know, woodcutters, hunters, recreationists. And so that is something that it, it can include, that rat grant can include um, public lands. A lot of our other grants we're looking for is always just on private property. So that project would complement some of the other efforts that is being done. I see on the projects from the RCD, they are targeting the Hennessy County Road, but it's from the 299 side up through those residents. And I don't know how far up and over, if you'd like, we could put in and ask for the whole road and or to complement. But what we'd like is the letter of support, um, just mostly, you know, so that we could, we're going to submit it. So, we're throwing it together. We have the deadline by September 30th. We did learn Humboldt County is not, they don't have an open rec grant right now. So we're gonna focus our energy on this one. And um, I was hoping to speak with Pat Frost about it. I'm not sure who the RAC coordinator is for Trinity County. Is that Pat? Uh, I'm the RAC chairman. The RAC coordinator is Monique Rea. I can send you her contact information. Okay, thank you. But uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, we're just, I'm new to this. I really don't understand a lot of it, but a letter of support would be great. I, you know, the Forest Service people and even the county roads, I mean, everybody was just kind of oblivious. Like they were even saying, oh, you mean the, um, the other road, the six and 12? Like, no, there is another road there. And again, those two roads are fairly close together at the entry points on South Fork. But the way they take off, there is a bluff in between them. Or, you know, it, it's just that County, Hennessy County 435 road is a very important um, ingress egress, you know, year round for uh, different reasons, emergency rigs, fire. Um, so I'd like to have you guys consider a letter of support, please. So Regina, I had a quick question first. Um, so is this in Six Rivers National Forest? Yes, it is. So one of the um, other things you might want to do is um, the the rack will um, will kind of look at whether or not you've talked to the district ranger about it. So I'm not sure if Lejean's still on here. I know he's Mad River, but you might want to 
had some discussions with the um, Six Rivers um, Ranger for that area and make sure you know they don't have it somewhere else. I mean, we we had this issue last year with a, a road that went to um, um, Alpine View Campground. It was it's a Forest Service road, not hadn't been maintained by them, and we proposed a rack project and then they said we we don't need it to be rack we can um you know just put it in our scheduled maintenance they sent out the the yeah. and all that kind of stuff so anyway I see a suggestion yeah thank you I did uh Nolan Colgrove is our district ranger for lower trinity and the Orleans district I have been in contact with him via email and he shared the other bits of information. So there is nothing on anybody's scope radar to have that road brushed, not even the Trinity County Roads Department. And it is their road, even though it goes to the National Forest. There's a couple stretches that uh, go through the private on the upper end of that 600 acres that used to be SPI land. It was divided into four different parcels from the ridge down to the river in four strips. And, but that road does go mostly through National Forest. And yes, I, I did make contact with um, the district ranger. Okay, and great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do I have any questions, comments, or concerns to send a letter of support for the Willow Creek Fire Safe Council in support of their RAC grant to treat along County Road 435 and the Forest Service sections? Um, for their application. What's the what's the grant ask going to be? Like ballpark? I don't really know actually that we're still kind of figuring some of these things out, you know, um, acreage and would most likely need to be contracted. We do figure we could look for, you know, a local person keep it in Trinity County. I don't think youth could be involved. You know, there was a lot of um, things that would promote approval of this grant. Money wise, I'm not 100% sure. Looking at the history, the only other time a RAC grant was uh, requested was combo between Humboldt and Trinity, and that's when they bought the chipper, and that was a fairly large amount. And um, so we're still getting some numbers about cost of acreage, what that would look like, and then the specs from the Forest Service on, like if they say 10 feet either side, or, you know, so there's gonna, we're gonna fine tune. I, I don't even have a ballpark guess right now. Okay, thank you. Do you know how many uh, feet or miles you're looking to treat on that road? From the Self Fork Road itself, up that 435 County Road to the top is approximately seven miles. Thank you. So if you do 10 feet on either side of the road, it's 15 acres for seven miles. Okay. Yeah, we threw out some numbers with guesstimation and um, but no, that's good information. What did we come up with? Um, yeah, okay, so 15 what? acres, you think? Yeah. Okay. Is it mostly yeah. trees or brush? Um, brush and logs. There's from the snow down, there's the woodcutters or whoever goes through the road have whittled away just enough to get the vehicles through. And a, an emergency rig could not make it through right now without whittling some more. Uh, the brush itself is so overgrown, you can't really even tell where the edges of the road are. That's where the county would come in and maybe be able to, um, you know, they weren't even aware of it. The guy says, oh, we've been slacking. They're gonna try to get up there. And so we'll see, I don't, I don't know if we would include the grading. I think just brushing because that's part of the project itself is um, even though it does say road maintenance, but I think just brushing it back and clearing off the debris and the logs that are um, just strewn ever that that snow down hit hard through there. It's um, so yeah. When you talk to the county, did they mention their right of way width in that area to see if you could go further than 10 feet? He mentioned that that's up to the Forest Service. Lejean has his hand up. Oh, sorry, Lejean. Uh, well, that was an opportune time because uh, I think I have the I was going to say the answer to your question. I believe it's 25 feet from the edge of the road either side. So if you're okay. talking about seven miles, I think you uh, estimated that far. Uh, 
15 acres for that uh, 10, 10 feet. So you're talking about 37 feet uh, or 37 acres approximately for that project. Okay. Yeah, that's a good guesstimate. You know, um, I don't even know a, a round a dollar amount to request before the 30th, which is next Friday. Um, hopefully we'll have it kind of fine tuned and um, I'm sure it's going to be a, on a higher dollar amount. Just I don't know that, you know, and then looking for local contractors so that we do keep it local or, you know, there was a lot of pluses to having these grants approved. So, um, you know, I don't, you know, some of the choices were noxious weed. I don't know that there's that much noxious weeds up there, but there is, I mean, it is spreading everywhere. I'm sure it's so brushy. It could be hiding in there. Um, so, and it's going to depend. I mean, so 35 feet. I, so like when we, when they came out and used the forest service specs to brush along Guy Covington drive, they essentially yeah. just took the mower and they went, you know, where all the brush was hanging over the road and it converted it from a two lane road into a one lane road. They went to the edge of the road and then the mower just leans over another five or six feet from the edge of the road. So if you're just talking about, you know, restoring the, you know, the pathway of the road, that's not going to be 35 feet. It's not even 10 feet from the edge of the road. It's just however far that that mower diameter, you know, the big yeah. mower thing is, you know, it's I would I would hope they don't use that mower. That thing is destructive and it makes more of a mess. We see what it does here on the South Fork. If there could be a crew that literally goes through, cuts brush, hack stack, we could chip or burn it later. That's not brushing though. So, I mean, I think the Forest Service maintenance specs for brushing might be different than if you're going in and cutting stuff down as a as more like a sh fuel break. And my, Rich, Tim can correct me, but I mean, if you're just mowing along the side, that's one thing. But if you're going in and you know, have a crew that's got to cut stuff down and it's going to be a lot more expensive. And I don't, you know, anyway. That's what we need. The mower, I don't think they'll take a mower up there. Um, there's mostly there's down trees that are like pixie sticked and, you know, on the road itself and in the switchbacks. And it, you know, if that could be cleaned up, they have limitations for sure, you know, cutting uh, anything larger than eight inch or, just, I, I think a hand crew going through with a chipper would be the best versus that mower. And that gets me back to, um, I'm waiting for contact from Rose Department from Six Rivers. But don't you need NEPA? I mean, so this was the same issue we had on Guy Covington at the intersection. You couldn't even just take out the little trees. That Nolan were said it's in place. Nolan reassured me this road has and so did Robert McConnell said this road has an existing NEPA. It's been done before. I don't know how long ago, but um, you know when they removed the hazard trees, I will definitely get more information. And if I could share that via email or with somebody that, you know, um, you know, this maybe still needs to make a decision to approve this or not, or because you're you're right, Carol. There is a lot of little uh, logistical things that I obviously don't have in front of me just yet, but um, I. I've never seen, I don't know that they take the brusher on this road and if you want to take a tour, come visit and check it out. And I appreciate any inside information. Well, I'm just wondering the stuff that's hanging onto the road other than the logs and stuff. I mean, is that brush that's hanging onto the road? Yeah, most of it is growing right in the, the, the ditches, the sides of the road. It's um, well, that's the same thing we had at Guy Covington and they just had their big mower thing just saying yeah, but that, sorry but that was that was the county to do it right i don't know that we would contract with the county to come make this happen that was the forest service brought their mower um do we want to discuss this uh between carol and regina off sorry. to help with the project development and then sorry. um not I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry for digressing. I was just trying to help with Regina. I do think it's a good project and that the Fire Safe Council should send a letter of support. I was just trying to, you know, narrow down exactly what the project looked like. 
Thank you. Okay, so full council, I'll draft a letter of support for Regina's project. Unless I hear concerns in the next few minutes, I would plan to share the letter with everybody for comment for a week before submission. Yeah, I've got a week. Okay. <laughs> That'll be a close call for you, Regina. Yes. I know. <laughs> So I, I want the minutes to show that I'm abstaining from the discussion and the decision as the RAC chair. I am also going to abstain hmm. from, oh, maybe, do I, should I not write the letter then? Should somebody else write the letter? Chris can write it. I'll write the letter. Bethany can write the letter. Just to be right. yeah. volunteer. And then uh, Carol, <laughs> are you um, voting or abstaining? Well, I guess I'll abstain. Okay. I already opened my mouth and said I thought it was a good project. <laughs> That's okay. All right. So from the rest of the council, I need um, uh, any dissent for sending a letter? None. Okay, great. We will move forward with that. They will move forward with that. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Fire State Council update for the coordinator. I'll try to keep it uh, brief. Our big things is to please welcome Miles and Charlie. So they are two new Grizzly Corps members. They are going to be working with our neighborhood ambassadors program to go out and do active firewise neighborhood community events. Um, we had our first orientation of our neighborhood ambassadors last week with uh, about seven of our neighborhood ambassadors. We had a few that weren't able to attend. So we're um, close to about 10 neighborhood ambassadors right now, right on track. We want to pilot this in a few different communities and then um, ramp up from there. So very happy with that, that so start. If I had known that's what they were, I would have gone full speed ahead for ready Freddie Raccoon with those guys having to wear the suit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our local area advisors orientation got postponed due to the training county collaborative group and some members of the local area advisors being on that group and so um, needed to schedule a different date and time. So we will be getting back with our local area advisors to get them up and rolling. Um, we also, uh, as a new member to our Trinity County Fire State Council family, we have Philip with us today. Philip, would you like to give a little introduction? Uh, yeah, I'll give a quick one. And I've got a meeting. I've got to go for two. But uh, my name is Philip Simi. I am the new OES manager for Trinity County. Um, I have an extensive background in fire service and emergency preparedness. And so um, I'm hoping to. to uh, Get out and, and meet more of you in the community and uh, see what OES can uh, can do for uh, for some of our other first responders. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. All right, um, Fire Safe Council wise, October twenty fifth and twenty sixth. Um, Chris, Dave, and I will be teaching the uh, National Volunteer Fire Councils Wildfire Wildland Fire Assessment Program. Uh, to our neighborhood ambassadors, our volunteer fire departments, and any other interested members um, of our community. That program is um, meant to be the long-term replacement for our Big Red Truck program. Um, so that's going to um, be a little bit more comprehensive. We're looking to get um, four ta five tablets um, through our current California Fire Safe Council Coordinator Grant to support the volunteer fire department in their reporting so that it's a digital reporting. They can do it offline, go back into Wi-Fi cell service. It will upload and have GPS references. Um, so Charlie's working on getting that up and running for us. And then, um, so similar to how Flash was using the ArcGIS survey, um, this will be a collector. Um, and so we'll be able to um, start managing some of that data better as well. Um, and it will be a, a more streamlined process in how um, the VFDs are reporting their assessments and then we do um, their payments for their, their visits. Um, due to the length increase, I'll likely renegotiate the contracts with the big rent and truck recipients um, because the survey is going to be um, 
it's going to take more time than the current big red truck program. It's, it's more comprehensive. And so um, I would, I feel better renegotiating with the big red truck participants because the price that they previously negotiated was not based on this longer form. Um, and so I want to share recognition of, of their time and effort um, to do that for us. Um, but it, we will also be have internal staff that um, will have funding and availability to go out and do these with areas that aren't enrolled in the big red truck program. Um, and so we'll be that's during the week. Um, and that's two days in person, one day in the classroom, one day in the field, looking at um, uh, going to two site visits and running through some of the dialogue, um, working um, with landowners, have have those discussions, uh, and it's all a suggestion-based um, program. And then um, we will also be looking at having another event in November that's then instead on the weekend and we're going to use a hybrid model so they have the modules online that they can walk, watch for the classroom and then we meet one day in November for that for the participants to come in person and do the site assessments um, and then ask any questions they had on the modules so we have um, two different styles because I'll likely be running one of the weekends one more solo so <laughs> That's our game plan for that. So the name of the program again, it's National Wildland Fire Assessment Program. <laughs> Wildland Fire Assessment so Program. National. Just, yeah, it's hosted by the National Volunteer Fire Council. Okay. Um, the, so next month we do have plans um, I believe to uh, discuss the MOU. And so I have been collecting um, various other counties MOUs and I will um, bring those together um, and make a couple recommendations as to um, after reviewing those, sharing them with everybody, but also make a few recommendations about uh, potential trajectories for our MOU and other questions. Lots of community meetings this fall, community chipping's gonna be up and running this fall again. We've got the dates finalized for that between the RCD and the Watershed Center. Um, just we'll be getting them advertised starting next week. Can you send us flyers to post? Cause I mean, that's gonna come up pretty quick. If it's October 3rd, people are gonna wanna start whacking stuff down. Yep. Uh, got a lot of good comments about putting them in the um, hardware stores last month, last time. So hardware stores at oh, Ace good. Hardware, yeah. uh, Bailey's, and then I think even somewhere down in near Willowbrook had them on their countertop too. Yeah. So. Yeah. Let's get some really good evidence. That's true. That's a good point. Um, all right. I will pass it on um, into the project updates. Uh, BLM's not here. Talpa. I'm uh, not a lot to report on. Um, we'll probably start looking at Big Creek after this rain um, for Vernon. Uh, I've been working with Chris and some of our other grantees on prescription expectations for Cal Fire dollars. Uh, and working on future projects right now. No one from Caltrans, no one from Humboldt County Fire Safe Council. Regina, do you have any update from the Lower Trinity PBA? Oh, the PBA. Well, um, yeah, there's a lot going on. Uh, PBA has been included along with the Willow Creek Fire Safe Council as partners um, for this CWDG grant that Humboldt County RCD is putting in. And um, I think there's been a little bit of um, prepping work done on two of the sites that have been identified to burn later on this fall. And um, I'm thinking they all attended that. There was also a Zoom meeting with um, Humboldt County RCD for this CWDG grant. So um, they're moving along. They've got monies um, for that coordinator position. And um, that's about it as far as I know. Thank you. Welcome. Um, let's see. 
NRCS, Erin. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, some of the most notable projects that we assisted with um, completing is the, our emergency watershed protection program. So that was um, assisting the debris flow cleanup after the river complex fire aftermath. So they're on Coffee Creek. So we um, that's pretty much wrapped up. And so we are moving forward with our, our fiscal year 2023 as we come to an end with our 2022 fiscal year in a couple next week on September 30th. So um, what that means is we will be um, getting receiving more information as to what our new updated payment schedules are for our future um, applicants. And so every every fiscal year NRCS's rates um, fluctuate and change. So I'm hoping with all of the inflation um, that we are experiencing, our, our rates will increase a little bit to compensate for, for that. And so I imagine we will have an influx of new participants, especially over in the um, Six Rivers uh, Lightning Complex footprint over in downriver in the Willow Creek greater area. So um, you know, I, I, you know, talking about the the community wildfire um, proposals that are being put into place. I imagine NRCS can assist um, with leveraging funds. So, if anyone you know is interested, please have them contact um, me to uh, see what we can do as far as collaborating with um, private landowners. Um, we are moving forward with um, hopefully receiving another joint chief um, uh, three year cycle. So we haven't received information as far as uh, who has been awarded for the FY23 uh, projects yet. So that was submitted. And um, if that if, if selected, then that means uh, Trinity County landowners and lessees are eligible to apply on the NRCS side for uh, EQIP funding. That's the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, so that if anyone's interested in hazardous fuels reduction related project work on private lands, that's where we come in. And then in conjunction, um, there's funding that will be set aside for uh, the Forest Service on the public land. So Lejean, I see you on the call and um, he, he was a big uh, help with that proposal. So thank you. We're just hopefully waiting to hear back. So hopefully by the next uh, next month's uh, meeting, we'll have an update. Um, um, other than that, we NRCS does have our catastrophic wildfire recovery fund pool set aside through EQIP. So if anyone unfortunately was affected by any of the recent wildfires, then we have specific funding set aside for that. And then of course we continue to have our forest health and resiliency related fund pools. So um, if anyone has any questions, they can contact me um, at the local field office and we can collect information to set up an initial site visit with each landowner. And I think that's all I had, thank you. Deb, oh, sorry, this questions is, for Aaron. My bad. So this is Pat Frost, and it's just more a comment. So Carol and I are in our fourth or fifth equip cost share agreement. And I think almost every time that we have entered into an agreement, the next year they increase the rates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um, and that's, that's kind of the unfortunate thing about it. Wait <laughs> next year. Yeah. Yeah. We have a five year agreement right now, so we're sunk. <laughs> yep. So that is a good point and note to make to everyone because it's whatever fiscal year um, the app the, the agreement or the contract was obligated in, it's locked into that rate. So that is something to consider. You know, if if able to complete the work all at once, depending on how the conservation plan was designed, that's usually how some folks um, they'll they'll just take care of everything all at once because there's no penalty to uh, to finish the work ahead of schedule. 
um, and especially because of you know the rates always increase. So depending, who knows what the cost of fuels reduction related work is going to be five years from now. So that is a very valid point, Pat and Carol. Yeah. So can we cancel our agreement and, and, and apply new? That's possible. That's possible. <laughs> but not encouraged, but it's possible. <laughs> Well, Lejean put a question in the chat that says, when are the Joint Chiefs um, expected to be selected? I would hope um, we would hear back by early October now, you know, that because that's the, the new fiscal year. Last year, for whatever reason, the response was very delayed, like four or five months delayed. And I don't know if that's because of turnovers or you know different people in different uh, positions at that time frame. but basically we have to wait from national headquarters. So I'm hoping sometime in October um, so that we can plan appropriately um, here at the local level in Trinity County, because what that means is um, if, if available and, and awarded, then Trinity County applicants would only have to compete against their fellow peers in Trinity County, as opposed to having to compete um, on a regional wide level, as well as a, California as a state. So that means the likelihood of being selected for a potential contract, the odds are pretty good. Remaining questions for Aaron. Hearing none, we will move to Deb. Were you able to sort out your sound? Yes, no, maybe? She went off mute. Deb, we're still not able to hear you. Um, if you would like to um, share anything, please type it in the chat and then we will go ahead and um, read it out when we look at it next. Um, safe, Larry. Yeah, um, we uh, went out on a couple of field trips with the Forest Service to, to look at the project we've been working on for eight years, which the Watershed Center is also involved in now. Um, it's called the Pilot Project. It's uh, been marked now, and everybody was very happy with the job that the marking crew did. It's a very positive uh, step. It's taken forever, but it's a very positive step, and hopefully it's the template for many, many more projects to come from the Forest Service. Any questions for Larry? Hearing none, Carol, Training Center Volunteer Fire Department. Um, I just had one, one minor request. Um, so we were playing with the Know Your Zone um, on the Fire Safe Council's website. And um, <laughs> the guys had the same problem I did. They kept clicking on the enter button on the bottom right and it wasn't working. They didn't realize they had to click the little box um, over on the left-hand side to get in. So I, I wonder, so what they suggested was that you maybe consider adding, um, I acknowledge before you say data within this is, you know, whatever, um, just there for advisory purposes because People, you know, not everybody's real um, internet savvy. They just didn't know that they had to click on that box in order to do the, for the enter button to work, if that makes any sense. Anyway, that was all we had. Carol, do, do you have a minute right after the meeting and we could just get that done real quick? Sure, sure, yeah. Okay, great. I wasn't sure who did it, so, but now I know. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> now I know who to talk to. That's it. Questions for Carol? None? Still. I do not have any to report. Questions for Joe? Why not? No. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I could report all kinds of stuff Joe here. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, collaborative group. I think Larry covered the main thing, which was that we had a couple of field trips that were great. One out to the Browns phase one and three, and uh, looked at a potential shaded fuel break, break area using a new CE the Forest Service has for up to a thousand feet uh, on Muscle Ridge. And then they had the marking field trip on the pilot project, which was really successful. We had collaborative meeting last week, but I think those were probably the highlights. Uh, planning a collaborative field trip, October, I think it's 21st, uh, third Friday, whatever that might be, yes. um, to go look at, begin to look at a kind of a big geographic area, which is from Burnt Ranch to Corral Bottom to High and Palm, so a big bar, big flat uh, as a potential next big NEPA project. So that's the 21st? If that's the third Friday. Yes. The idea is that it's trying to bring in the Burt Ranch project that had a lot of work on it and never got to the finish line and the Corral Bottom project that we started looking at and never got to the finish line and the High and Palm project that we kind of started but never really got to the, okay, now it's, we're, we're doing the NEPA. So if we're gonna do three projects, it'll take forever. We can do a big project faster. Cool. The NEPA. The NEPA, hopefully. And there's some other stuff that we're looking at as well that I'll update on here. Yeah. Great. So I, I think that's it. Uh, uh, Jerry, Larry, anything else? I don't think Jerry's on anymore. Yeah, no, sure. that covered it, Pat. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Ren, do you have anything to share from Penny Lumber side of things? I don't have anything to share. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Amelia? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, I was wondering before you got to Trinity County RCD if you wanted to do Trinity County OES. <laughs> Yes, they're on my list. I got them. They are uh, the same wavelength. I've, I've been married. I had written years. them down even before Pat said anything. Um, <laughs> they were going to replace Trinity County planning. Planning doesn't usually come. Um, but let's read Deb's real quick. And then, yes, we'll hop to um, Mike. Um, so prescribed burning has started. Smoke management plants are rolling in. Uh, there is women in trucks training at the beginning of the week with travel trucks will begin after the women's truck ends. Projects for women's tracks is proposed for Forest Service lands around Orleans. Grant funds will be available for the coming year to pay for the permit fees associated with smoke management plans. So no uh, air quality fees on projects this year or next year. That's a yay. Yeah. Right. Third year. Keep it rolling. Keep going. Okay. Questions for Deb? We can uh, ask or type them in and she can respond. So there's no fees for smoke management plans. Does that also mean no fees for burn permits? <laughs> no. No, okay. I believe it's smoke management plans specific for agencies, right? Not even for public members of the public. I don't know how far that goes. Okay. Well, it, just, it says no air quality fees for projects, but okay, never mind. Deb, will you just type in and clarify if the um, fees are only covered for agency projects or if they're also covered for um, private smoke management plants? Thank you. Okay. Um, Training County OES. Okay. Hi. Um, so let's see the stuff we have going on, uh, it's kind of more related to fire. Um, we were able to modify one of our grants. We had some requests from a couple of uh, volunteer fire departments for some uh, equipment. So we were able to make a modification to our grant to provide some uh, couple of laptops for downriver fire and some helmets and goggles for Trinity Center. I do have those for you, Carol, so I'll shoot you an email. They just came oh. in. Um, Another thing we're looking at is kind of along the lines of the data collection that a couple of people have talked about. Um, one of the challenges we have uh, after fires uh, is assessing damage. And um, for instance, when assessing, uh, you know, residential loss from fire, um, environmental health has their hands full with going out there with basically pen and paper to collect that information. So 
we found a software program that will allow us to do um, kind of offline data collection using tablets and soft phone, uh, cell phones to collect data and then pro provide real-time data to the EOC on structure damage. So looking forward to adopting that and getting it ready um, for next time it's needed. Uh, we are also able to get some grant funding from Humboldt Area Foundation to provide some fire shelters for uh, sheriff's office, uh, sheriff's deputies, and probation officers who are out there doing evacuations. Uh, challenge now is just finding some because everybody seems to be out of stock, so still looking for those. Um, we had another uh, local area advisor submission, uh, and that's for uh, Jerry for the Weaverville community, and that's been submitted. Hopefully that'll make the board agenda for October 4th. And that's about it. Any questions for Mike? Great, thank you for joining us, Mike. Um, Trinity County RCD, uh, Kelly? Chris, Chris, you want to start? Sure. The, uh, so we got four crews currently working. Two of the crews are out in uh, the Mad River Ranger District working on like roadside kind of field reduction. And they'll probably be out there until they can't drive out there anymore. <laughs> and then we have, since the last kind of reporting, we've had continued work up on the uh, Browns Mountain on a fuel break that we've also been working with, with Dave a little bit, as well as some of our other partners on creating a larger fuel break on top of Browns Mountain. So that's more of a future project where we're starting with what we can currently. So they've been up there. And then we've also continued to work on BLM lands under our fire prevention grant through CAL FIRE, expanding the, the, the fuel break, roadside fuel break along Democrat Gulfs Road, as far as that goes along the, uh, the ridge line up there. And then upcoming, we're probably gonna shift uh, the two crews that aren't going into Ruth to start the, the Guy Covington project. It seems like the uh, project activity levels are in our favor currently and will probably continue to be so for probably most of the season. So we're going to hopefully get out there next Monday and uh, keep chipping away at that. And then we've been doing some more planning with the, uh, the Downriver folks and hopefully we'll start our storm recovery work coming as soon as we finalize some of the, the planning for that. So that's also upcoming, but that's that's where our crews are and kind of what we've been up to. And then I guess on a, on a separate kind of note, outside of our crews, we uh, brought Bethany on and she's been working diligently for our contracting. And so we put multiple contracts in place, uh, ones for around a hundred acres of hand treatment in the Lake Forest, the plantations out in the Lake Forest area. And there's a field tour next Monday. So hopefully maybe some time. So you got a request for bids out. Yeah, they're not in place. They're not in place. Correctly. Yeah. The bid, yeah, the bids are out. And then uh also uh, a package together for the watershed center to do a bunch of mastication out in the Lake Forest units as well. And then we have another bid package out that will tour with contractors next week for around 120 acres of treatment that we're going to contract out in on BLM land and they're reading in the Creek area. So, cool. so those are upcoming. Got a question. It may be not you guys, but um, I'm one of those people that reads everything in the Trinity Journal. There was a letter to the editor. They were wrong. About um, all the pie. They, they thought Sorry. the work is great on Trinity Dam Boulevard. But when is this burning going to happen? So I didn't know yeah. who, who whose work that was. No, I who that. has the answer to the question? And they, they That's mentioned my That's yours. Okay, so we can wait till. So there's there's other work in the Lewiston area that was done under oh, BLM. Oh, Marsh Creek Road yeah. and stuff. There. Nobody's complaining. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> oh well. I wouldn't say no one. Yeah, <laughs> they are. I get calls about this. So so what is the answer that? Are in the piles. It's right. for service yeah. on Trinity Dam Boulevard. Okay. I've been talking with you guys about that for yeah. six months. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I'd add from the RCD side is that <clears throat> the Weaverville Community Forest Steering Committee has been um, has provided like pre scoping comments to uh, the BLM for the Oregon Mountain uh, timber sale uh, environmental. Uh, 
assessment. And so we're we're working with them uh, to address some some concerns that the the steering committee has with regard to their preferred alternative, which has a fairly low crown uh, canopy uh, cover. So uh, we'll be working with them a little bit to try to come to some level of consensus across the board before it actually goes to public scoping. That's all I got. The agreement we just signed with you guys for sale timber prep. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, I didn't know if we were talk about that one or not. I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> Did you want to talk about that? That we just signed. We signed an agreement with you guys for like doing timber prep type oh, of activities. There was, that's that's through the modification. Yeah, was signed. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's, well, that's new to me. But uh, I guess I could talk about what that was designed for. I didn't realize it was signed at this. It point. just happened this week. Oh. So the uh, so we've also got an agreement with the Forest Service now to further, I guess, facilitate and assist um, them on the the forestry side of things for for doing unit layout as well as project layout and forestry services that sometimes it's hard to hire seasonal score so we can hopefully step in and hire some people that that will be more focused on the forestry end which is something the rcg has been trying to get into for for a while and so it's, it's moving cool. forward so. i had signed it i just didn't know if it had been fully executed so. yeah <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, right. There is that. <laughs> we'll ask for a copy. If you could provide one, uh, Kelly McElroy yes. said it was that it was done. So at whatever okay, point that it comes back. Here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Tim. All right. Yeah, Tim, okay. So uh on the forest service side, uh on the Trinity River Management Unit, uh, and including the South Fork, uh, just earlier this week, we got hit up about the Klamath Basin restoration opportunities, which includes the Trinity River watershed. So there was money allocated out of the bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, that was signed last year. Uh, the Klamath Basin is a high risk watershed just due to the amount of fire that we have. So we have been trying to plug in some projects uh, they have the money has to be uh, allocated in fiscal year 23 so it was like it came from the Washington office down to me in like three days and that's normally like a three month process to get down to me so it's uh, was a really fast turnaround we're uh, identifying some work within the community forest as part of that uh, some of the tippers projects that are downriver there'll probably be a little bit of stuff in the August complex um, that has been identified. So this is for uh, implementation ready projects or very near completed NEPA. So um, so how much money? It's the infrastructure law there. They didn't say how much. And so it, it goes up in Oregon, like anything that flows into the Klamath River is included in this. So it's, it's a big chunk, it's for federal lands only. Um, at this time. And so work can be hazard tree abatement. So any of the fires uh, that we have, reforestation, hazardous fuels treatments, or aquatic organism passage. So and I would assume Six Rivers got the same. I'm sure they did. Yeah. So yeah what about Gina's project? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. It, you know. Yeah. Where it crosses federal land. Yeah. Yeah. It could. It could certainly it federal it, land and it's yeah so it would fall in the, the third category there of the hazardous fuels treatments um so that was like hey work on this now kind of stuff uh prioritize it um the uh second thing uh that's probably more long term and let me change my computer slide so um they the Hermit's Peak and the Calf Canyon fires in New Mexico this year, they implemented, they were escaped prescribed fires. They implemented a 90 day shutdown for all prescribed fire activities with the Forest Service. Uh, that has been lifted, but they uh, sent out their national findings with seven recommendations that we will follow. Um, so uh, it, 
there's going to be some changes. So uh, prior to implementation, every Forest Service prescribed fire burn plan has to be reviewed and updated to the new standards. And so that there's going to be some work there. So I know Deb says they're going to start prescribed fire, but if they don't get the burn plans updated, you're not going to start prescribed fire. So that's uh, step number one. Uh, number two is every single day you will have a discussion with the agency administrator before you can ignite your fire. In the past, we've been able to get like a season or a seasonal authorization. So, you know, when we're burning piles and we're burning piles every day, they're like, talk to us in April when the risk really starts becoming more relevant. Every single day now we have to talk to an agency administrator. And so there's uh, probably a degree of we need to control it a little bit more, but also that we're sharing risk with the agency administrator. So there's some uh, some good stuff that who, who will be associated agency, with that. Who's an agency administrator? Um, Tara could do our low complexity pile burns, but if we're doing a understory burn, the only person on our forest right now is Carolyn Knapper, who's the district ranger in Mount Shasta. So that, um, okay. so there's, like I said, so there's some good and some stuff that we're gonna have to work through on there. Uh, they want us to really consider drought metrics and how that plays into prescribed fire. Uh, be, when we do our day of on the burn, go, no go checklist, there's some communication that has to be had with the agency administrator before we actually make the decision to continue with the prescribed fire. Um, the agency administrator will be on scene for every high complexity burn, on scene for 40% of the low, moderate complexity, and then low complexity pile burns that they recommend that they come out and visit, but they don't have to actually be on scene. Um, there's required training that is that we're all going to have to go to on uh, there's going to be a national person that just kind of oversees everything. So there was also some recommendations that came out they're going to establish a Western prescribed fire training center. And they're supposed to have a curriculum for that by January 1st. So I don't know how they're going to turn that out that fast. Um, but there's one that's hosted out of Tallahassee on the East Coast. It's uh, very successful for what they do. Uh, so they're gonna try to bring some of that out to the West Coast and provide some additional opportunities. Uh, a little bit more information about how the remote weather stations are functioning. Are they being maintained to standards? If they're not, then is your burn truly, or is your weather truly representative of your burn? And so we can mitigate some of that by being on site and taking weather for a couple of days prior to the burn. Uh, prescribed fire websites, so separate of PFERS that we do with uh, Deb. Uh, some uh, more consistent training. And so a lot of the recommendations we've already been doing on our forest, you know, consultation with the weather service, we do all that stuff already. So. Uh, maybe we were, hopefully we were an example that they brought some of this stuff from, um, but it, there's going to be some legwork before we can implement any prescribed fire. Okay. So, um, and then there's like 36 long-term recommendations that they're looking at uh, through right now. And in a year, they'll evaluate all of it and determine if it's, if it's appropriate. So uh, with the wildfire crisis implementation strategy, prescribed buyers, a big part of it, treating 30 million more acres of federal and 50 million acres of partner uh, land in a 10 year period. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is just another hurdle that will be uh, in that implementation, you know. So the Klamath region got identified as, hey, this is a priority watershed, go treat it. So that's good locally. Um, so, uh, again, like I said, we'll see how that all, uh, shakes out. So, go ahead. Is it, um, so the new trainings and that kind of stuff, will you be requiring your partnering agencies out there on your prescribed burns to complete those trainings as well? I have well? no further information other than it's required training. Okay. There was a statement that said all means all. So that does, I don't, so I don't know if I say, hey, RCD, you're going to come burn with me today that you're required to go to that training. I don't think so. All means all, Chris. That's what we were told when I asked. Yeah. 
Um, so we're going to uh, be having a forest fuels meeting next week so we can uh, figure out our strategy to really approach this and get through the training. Uh, the forest supervisor is the one responsible for uh, leading this training. It's meant to be a discussion. It's not meant to be a video. So um, they want it to be in person or via Teams, not just her watch the video <laughs> and you guys are good to go. And it has to go all the way to the national office that we've done it before we can implement prescribed fire. So there's hurdles. Yeah. Probably going to miss some prescribed fire windows um, as we're figuring this out. But, you know, if we can safely or correctly implement this and then still be able to prevent risk to the communities, then that's that's what we're going to do. Uh, on the Trinity River, we're going to try to do seven day staffing throughout the winter so we can implement prescribed fire every day that we have an opportunity. We're in the process right now of trying to hire a six person winter fuels module. There's uh, there's quite a few folks that are on the list, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get at least four of them to accept positions here and then uh, increase our capacity that would also be increased by our CD and the watershed center having uh, folks that can help as well. Um, the last thing I have is, uh, so the wildfirerisk.org, I talked to the Fire Safe Council about that website a few years ago, KRCR got a hold of it. It shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that every community in Trinity County with the exception of one is above the 90th percentile. And the only one that's below the 90th percentile is Trinity Center. So it's like, and on, like it's, that's probably a pretty good assessment of, you know, just cause Trinity Center's flat, it's got the lake, it's got the Swift Creek drainage that comes through there, so. Or at least we have the dirt for the lake. Why yeah, the something. Dirt? It's a pretty good fuel break, whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> um, so I would encourage folks to go and look at that, understand what it is. Um, you know, like I said, KRCR, that was a, a surprise question from them and uh, last week. So they wanted to know what we're doing. Um, as far as the piles out on uh, Trinity Dam Boulevard, we have completed 99.9% .9 of the project. There's some hazard trees that we need to fall still with the contractors, a little bit of cleanup that needs to be done on some spots that they missed. Um, the intent, given all the rewrite of the burn plans and everything that we're trying to do, the intent would be uh, that we will work through that project all winter long and try to get as many of those piles burned as we can. I'm going to try to redo my agreement with Cal Fire with the thought that it's right down the hill from the camp and that they could put a crew on it with our helicopter crew just about every day of the week and and go to work. So I think the good news about the letter to the editor was they were very positive about the work that was done. Just the concern is the recurring concern that we have over smoke issues with people with compromised lungs. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's just a forever educating people about the, do you want a couple of days in the winter or do you want all summer? Yeah, when we can mitigate it and manage it and yeah. Mike, on that topic, do you know, um, does HS HHS run any programs to provide um, either air filters or replacements for the air filters um, in areas or, or throughout the county in general for vulnerable individuals? Um, it's something that other counties are doing that to support their burn management and to support um, that they're acquiring grants to purchase air purifiers yeah. and provide them to um, vulnerable in individuals to then right. use. Just to be used in the home, not like a yes. a clean air center. Right. Like using the yeah. Does HHS do yeah. anything like that? So uh, public health does have a supply of the larger kind of industrial size HEPA units. Um, and those are already, uh, most of them already for, kind of deployed to uh, some of the volunteer fire departments. So we have, we do have one in, in the library here in Weaverville. We've put them out in various locations in the county, depending on where, you know, where smoke is a problem. Uh, I think they are looking at some uh, grant programs, not necessarily provide individual air uh, filters, but for, um, I know that there was a clean air or air quality grant this year, I think to 
provide more um, permanent upgrades to buildings to filter um, smoke and such. Uh, but what typically happens with, for instance, the units that public health has is that depending on where air quality is bad, they will deploy those units to um, kind of more congregate or places that have congregate settings, whether it's like a senior center, like I said, a library, a Red Cross shelter, somewhere where there's a lot of people, uh, because those units are really made for larger um, areas. Um, I don't know if they're looking at doing in the, uh, grants for individual units. I'll reach out to them. I, I think that's something worth looking into to help um, increase buy-in as we go and mm -hmm. push more um, prescribed burning in the future. Yeah, and with prescribed fire and, and Deb's listening, and I know she's aware of this, like our intent, it's like, it's nuisance smoke, right? That's what we are producing with prescribed fire. Like we should not be putting communities at risk or mm -hmm. people at risk with prescribed fire smoke. If they live directly adjacent to the project, then we can work with them on timing and some other things, but uh, general, especially pile burning, the intent is not to put people at risk ever. Great. Uh, any other questions uh, for Tim or Chris? Or Nate. Or Nate. Or Nate. Does he have anything to report out? Okay. Uh, nothing to add. Thank you, though. Great. Um, Lejean, do you have anything to report out for Six Rivers National Forest? Uh, I mean, it's already been partially touched upon, but TCRCD is working on a number of projects uh, with us. Nancy Kern, she has the most up-to-date information. Unfortunately, she couldn't be with us today. Uh, but one of those projects, uh, the fuels reduction along the roads, that's the Trinity County CWPP uh, roads that were identified by Captain Pomzinia Volunteer Fire Department and the Southern Trinity Volunteer Fire Department. So those are ongoing. Uh, other than that, the roads crew with TCRCD are working to implement a number of repairs uh, slash maintenance uh, work on a couple of critical roads that are going to be needed for uh, other projects in 23, 24, uh, as well as just making sure that those are safe for e egress, ingress. Uh, those are the major points. The air curtain burner, which has been very popular in the area, uh, continues to burn. We're well over 2,000 tons of uh, burned material at this point. Uh, I'll just throw out a couple other projects that she wrote down for me. So if, if they have any bearing in your knowledge or if you have any questions, I can uh, take those and follow up with them. But she's been continuing, her and uh, the staff down here have been continuing on the Mad Ridge fuel break, the Van Dusen vegetation management project and the uh, August complex fire line pile burns. So I, uh, there's been a lot of good progress. Everything is really sped up in this fourth quarter. Uh, and we're looking at having some really good years in the 23-24 with uh, all our NEPA coming online. Uh, funding is available. So we got a lot of projects, a lot of work to be implemented in 23 and 24. The only other big project I'll mention, the timber sale, uh, Acre Woods was advertised last month. Uh, it is expected to be sold by the end of this uh, fiscal year. So, and that's 6.1 million board feet. That's, that's all the highlights. Any questions? Lejean, is that still a roadside shaded fuel break project or has it been changed? For the acre woods, it, it, it hasn't changed. It's the same project. Uh, that got interrupted by the August complex. Thanks. Yep. Additional questions for Lejean. Cool. Uh, Watershed Research and Training Center, Xander. Still there. 
Um, start with Bowerman Cooperative Field Break Project. Uh, I think we're still looking to um, start scoping by the end of this month. Uh, so that seems to be on pace. Um, I think various people covered what um, our crews and machines have lined up um, in the short term going forward. Um, other planning, um, CWDF um, grant uh, application, talked about that. Um, and I think we're, um, Randy's starting to look at um, how we're going to use the new mastered stewardship agreement that the watershed center has with the forest service now. Um, and my understanding of that is we'll be able to um, help them out with uh, everything from planning to implementation and we'll be able to uh, help with some of the contract administration there too for projects. Um, and I think we're focused within um, the monument burn for now um, under that agreement and that's what we're prioritizing it seems like. Um, and then there was another um, agreement that recently got signed with um, the BLM which I think is is fairly similar in that um, we'll be able to assist with uh, planning at least of some projects, but I don't have a full understanding of that. Um, for Weaver Basin, um, our pyro folks are, um, I believe they started or they will start soon. Um, doing some um, refreshing some control lines in preparation for a burn of uh, the unit they burned um, within the last couple of years on uh, between five and 10 cent gulch. Um, it's part of the water tower, they're out there yesterday. Yeah. And then um, we're working with the RCD on compliance for um, sort of a broader project, uh, the north side of the Weaver Basin um, to do a lot more uh, fuels treatments and prescribed fire um, and that's that's uh, in the works so once we get the green light on compliance there we'll be able to start doing that too and I think that's um, everything that I have that's new around here any questions for Xander Okay. Um, Willow Creek Fire Suit Council, Regina. Yeah. Um, there's a lot going on, of course, and trying to keep up with it all. But some of our basic simple things, our fundraiser for October spaghetti dinner is either going to be postponed. Um, the fire camp group is still at that VFW hall. And then we have, um, of course, we've been busy with our chipping days. It's volunteer residential chipping. We go again this Friday. Uh, we do have our um, subcontractor, Jeffrey Churchill, on board. We start something October 3rd with um, some of Hodgson Hill taking on a project that um, was in the work some time ago. And so we're going to tackle that um, with him and then continue on with some other areas identified. We did receive that technical assistance support grant. And um, I'll have an interview with NCRP here Monday or tomorrow. And then um, I guess our biggest thing is that we've been asked to partner up with the Humboldt County RCD with that in CWDG grant. They're gonna ask for 10 million. So that will include other partners within the area like the PBA and the Willow Creek Fire Safe Council. I don't know what our role is completely. I know they want to build crew capacity. They keep throwing that out there. Like we could have somebody working for us and there's quite a bit of monies there. If that even goes through, um, Tim Bailey did suggest that Willow Creek is a good fit for this project. Um, you know, it's kind of nice to be the last person because I get to hear everything and then I have all these additional questions and ideas. So um, I was very interested in hearing about the, the Forest Service lands, you know, with that project from the Trinity River watershed, whoever that is. And so um, I did put in the chat my email and the Fire Safe Council email. If anybody has additional information, please send it to me so that we can help 
keep me sorted out and straightened out. I have so much going on. I just didn't realize and <laughs> and uh, starting to feel overwhelmed. But I know there's great and grand things happening. The Fire Safe Council is thriving at this time. We've got our um, office where we're trying to stay organized. And I appreciate the Trinity County Fire Safe Council and the RCD group for all your involvement and everybody else's good information. Thank you. Any questions for Regina? All right, closing comments. None? So I'll, the email I sent you, Amelia, okay. like I, I would just like to request that uh, at some point the Fire Safe Council has the probably more of the implementers group get together and just talk about the projects that we are planning or implementing, how they apply to the CWPP, where they connect, where we can look at opportunities to connect projects. And so we've done it a few times in the past. I think there was some a uh, significant benefit having that smaller group of just the really the the land management group there to to er get everybody onto the same page um so i would request that we do that at some point and then as always pat used to remind us all the time we're coming to the end of the year we got to get the data to you guys to house so we know where we actually are doing C cwp pro projects and you know the work that we've done around firewise communities and stuff like that so Thank There's you. your plug, Pat. Thank you, Tim. Not my job. <laughs> and yes, the um, Firewise Renewal Survey went out in the letter last, or this week, the newsletter. Um, so it's a Google survey for you to plug in. If you want me to send you an Excel instead, I can do that. Would you like an Excel? I didn't even, yeah, I'm so busy. I didn't even have a chance to look at it. Okay. Um, but it is there so that you essentially you pick which community and then you say what you did in that select another community so we vote in what cool. you did there and can repeat yeah. and so it um it a little makes, more organized in my email how many acres do any doubt um then the other part with that is firewise um has a few more um hoops we're jumping through this year so i'm going to be working through those um, Pat, I need to talk to you about your past boundaries and what you did for those. Um, and, and we were looking at um, just either being consistent or, or um, redefining if we needed to, um, but trying to do it inclusively. And then um, Miles, Charlie, and Bethany will be going out and doing the community assessments this month. Um, and so we're going to do downrivers when we're down there with Regina, Dina, and Anita um, on our, our South County tour next week. Um, if anybody else wants to come, we're going to look at um, South Fork, Salyer, Hawkins Bar, and then into Burnt Ranch on, on some of the private lands um, on the 27th. So uh Salyer, Hawkins Bar, or sorry, sorry, Salyer, we're hitting around 10 a.m., Hawkins Bar at 1, and then with the goal to be in Burnt Ranch around 3. Um, and so if anybody's interested, let me know, and I'll keep you in the conversation as we uh, prepare for that. And then, um, then once we do that as a group, then they'll be going out and doing it throughout the rest of the county to get those updated. New requirement is that we have a three-year action plan. Um, so for this year, it's going to be a little cookie cutter um, exercise, uh, neighborhood ambassador program, firewise community meetings, all that kind of stuff, kind of pre program And then um, based on where the communities are, what other projects are currently ongoing. And then next year, we'll be able to uh, deep dive a little bit better and do a better analysis for what the community needs and how to make that uh, three-year plan stronger. And then was the other part of that? Oh, a board. We need to form a board, and it is no longer sufficient for the Trinity County Fire Safe Council to be um, the board for all of the fire safe counts or for all the firewise communities. Um, so I will be working with the neighborhood ambassadors, local area advisors, and the volunteer fire departments or the um, CSDs that oversee the volunteer fire departments to secure um, at least five members um, into put together a board for these firewest communities um, with the intent that 
um, probably the fire safety council coordinator would sit on the board to do the majority of the work, have the board meet once a year to provide feedback and then keep things moving forward. And my understanding is the big reason for this push for more is that insurance companies are getting pushed to recognize firewise communities through their rates. And so the firewise community national program felt it was incumbent to kind of beef up the, right. the firewise effort. But these are specific California firewise requirements too, right. not nationwide, um, but, but yes. Um, so thank goodness for Bethany, Charlie and Miles. Uh, I would not be so calm right now if that was all on me. So thank, thank them. Um, the other thing, right, is um, based on that, and I am open to feedback right now about how I am doing. I was trying to put a survey together. I didn't quite get there. I'll get you one at some point. Um, but what you would like to see from the Fire Safety Council coordinator in the future, what you need, what am I doing well, what am I not doing well, how can I improve, how can I organize this group to work better, implement better. Um, so give me some thoughts, some ideas. I've already reached out to a couple people and had a different couple different um, phone calls and that kind of stuff, um, but I will give a more like solicited option for everyone as well as needed. So it's coming, I'll get there, I promise. Amelia, I had one one kind of thing to tag on to what Tim said about the implementers meeting. Yes. Um, I think that's a great idea. Um, and I forgot to say earlier, um, I did get a question last week about the number one project for Coffee Creek, which was South Derrick Flat Road, uh, shaded fuel break there. There was a lot of work done with the um, river complex, you know, along the power line and stuff. But um, anyway, that would be a project as you're looking at implementation of future CWP pro CWPP projects mm -hmm. to maybe look at that, that number one project. That, that was the request from the new owners of the Coffee Creek store. Okay. Thank you. All right, without further ado, thank you all for your time today. Thank you for staying up past three o'clock. Uh, and I hope you guys all have a lovely end to your week. I'd remind people to look at their calendars before the October meeting, because we always have to pick us a meeting that is a November, December meeting, because right. we don't want to come and meet on Thanksgiving. It's on the agenda already, right. the draft cool. agenda. Um, and please submit your FireWise Renewal information, please, please don't make me hunt you down. Don't do it on November 10th. That's tricky day. Goodbye. We're the poor service. Thanks.